This episode of Beauty and the Surgeon podcast is brought to you by Let's Get Checked. Let's Get Checked is an online company dedicated to making professional health testing easy and accessible. Let's Get Checked offers fast, affordable, completely confidential at-home health tests from a range of tests from STDs, male and female hormones, and even COVID-19. Listeners of our podcast who are new to Let's Get Checked get 20% off by using our URL, trylgc.com slash beauty, and be sure to use the code beauty20 at checkout. That's trylgc.com, T-R-Y-L-G-C.com slash beauty, B-E-A-U-T-Y, and be sure to use the code beauty20, beauty20 at checkout. Do it. Getting tested is important. It's the responsible thing to do, and you know how important I think it is to make sure you understand your labs. Welcome everyone to Beauty and the Surgeon podcast. I'm Amy. I'm a nutritional therapy practitioner, and I'm joined today, as always, by Dr. Jason Martin. My very fastidious co-host. He's yep. a board certified plastic and reconstructive surgeon. Yes, we've Dr. established Martin. that, Amy. I'm board How certified. You doing? Good. We, very good. You know what? I'm never going to stop. We've said it on every episode. We're going to keep saying it on yep. every episode. It's still important. And I have my surgery cap on because today I did a facelift, which sounds like it's very apropos for our topic. It is because today we are talking about facelifts. So if you are listening to this podcast and you'd like to see some really awesome pictures and drawings and before and afters, I highly recommend going over to our YouTube channel and finding us at Jason Martin MD. While you're there, subscribe because there's more more good stuff coming. Like and subscribe. Do yes, everything you're supposed comment. to do. Yeah, do all the stuff. Our podcast today, last week or two weeks ago, so we busted some myths about facelifts, some yep. common myths. And today we're going to talk about everything else you need to know about face and neck lifts. So now that you're not afraid of looking weird or your sister giving you a hard time for getting a facelift or, or you're too old or you're too young, too old, too young, um, all the other myths we busted. Now, you know that those things aren't real. I mean, there was 10 myths, Yes, 10 myths. So we we really went to the busting. We busted a lot of we myths. We busted a lot of myths. Yeah. So now you're not afraid. You know that you're probably a candidate or you're not. And now you want to know everything else about facelifts. Yeah, we're going to do it top to bottom. Yes. So before we get into the meat of this episode, we're, we have a shout out. And I love this so much. So it's going to be hard to see, Dr. Martin, for you. But if you zoom in on this picture, this license plate, this came from our favorite listener in Sweden, blah, blah, blah. She sent me this picture of a license plate that it's Amy 499. And like, I have always wished that like, you know, there's three letters in a license plate. Like, how is it that I cannot get Amy as my three letters? It's never happened. So she actually said it, that it's an extremely uncommon name in Sweden. Like, so there's like three Amy's in the entire country. And this is one of them. Well, it's just, it's not a custom license plate. Oh, it's so it's chance. just random. Yeah. She was like, leave me a gas station. She's like, I pulled out of the gas station. This was the car in front of me. That's hilarious. Which I, I love. And yes, I mean, not a vanity plate, but like, oh, that's so awesome. So thank you. And it looks like a beautiful day. I mean, look, look, look at that. I mean, like more than anything. You got to look at our YouTube channel. Yeah. We're going to share this picture. What are we doing here? Yeah, let's go. Oh, <laughs> like, can, the we screen. Go, can we go hang out with blah, blah, blah for a couple of weeks? Yeah. Could this be a more picturesque picture? Like right. there's like it's these It's not that hard to do a podcast, and, right? You know, yes. we, don't, we only need about yeah. five truckloads of mechanical, and you know, stuff. Yeah. Looking out the vista of like oh, trees and blue sky and clouds. Like it looks beautiful. So just, thank you just, so much. That just, that's amazing looking. So thank you, blah, blah, blah. And yeah, I mean, if it wasn't illegal, I would say maybe like snag that license plate, but totally right. against the law. I'm sure in all countries to steal a license plate. Yeah. Not legal. All right. So. Let's start talking about face and neck lifts. We always start these procedure-based podcast episodes with the statistics, mostly mm -hmm. just so we can see how many times I, I can, can say, say statistics. statistics without messing it up. Okay, you know, before we get into this also, <laughs> I was listening to a podcast just a couple of days ago, and <laughs> one guy kept saying hemocysteine right. instead of <laughs> homocysteine. Yes, and I'm like, oh my gosh, Hemio. it's me. Yeah. So it's not just me, but yeah. So we're talking about statistics and we are looking at the statistics. But we're not we're not gonna sit here and chastise you and make fun of you for your speech impediments. No. <laughs> Only when I would, actually that, have them. That would be shaming. So yes. we're gonna be nurturing and supportive of the fact that you say words like you were raised in England. Or somewhere else. Or somewhere yeah. else not related to America and Colorado. I have a, I have a, a weird state. Colorado accent. Yeah. So Sarah did something super cool this year. She actually took the male and female because they do break it down nice. on some of these procedures. So which I thought was super cool. More proof that like, yes, men do have facelifts. Um, the numbers are much smaller. If you look at the total numbers, I mean, we've got over 200,000 women and only about 18,000 men in the year 2020. But, you know, there's still like it's a. A significant amount of men are having facelifts, as we talked about a few episodes. Well, actually, it's been a while now because what is time? Um, men do get facelifts. The numbers for facelifts have changed quite a bit. If you look back 20 years, 
um, more, like more than 100,000 more people every year. So it is, I think that's a sign of an aging population in some senses, but it's definitely, I think, also shows that more people than you think are probably getting face and neck lifts. Right. That goes back to our myth busting episode. Like not everyone will know. Busted. <laughs> yes. <laughs> in fact, no one will know. You're just going to look amazing. So don't be yeah. afraid. A lot of people getting face lifts every year. And this is just with board certified plastic surgeons. And uh, look, I mean, another myth busted. Oh, Age ages. 70 and over is mm -hmm. over 30,000. So that was one of our questions. Well, too old. and if you look at the 40 to 40 to 54, I mean, yeah, that's almost 50, 50,000. Yeah. And, you know, I'm in my 40s. Amy is in her 20s. Yeah. Still. And, uh, Will be forever. <laughs> so, you know, it's weird. I mean, it's kind of even I do this for a living. I was like, oh, would I ever get a facelift, you know? Yeah. But it just depends on your presentation. And that's the main caveat to what we talked about in the myth busting episode. It really depends on what you're presenting with and what your health history is. So you as an individual. Yeah, absolutely. And age is, I mean, even the 20 to 29, there were 742 people. And I think that was all, it was the entire Kardashian family. Right. Well, the, the ones who <laughs> all had the no, cousins and yeah, second cousins, all of them. <laughs> it was everyone who was on a reality show. Yeah. I, mean, I think the youngest person we've ever done a true facelift on was like 36, I want to say. Yeah. Um, a true facelift, but I mean, there are definitely other facelifting type procedures that right. you know you can do in a it's younger hard age. What, you know, you'd have to know exactly what they're um, getting done. Yeah. yeah. All right. So a lot of people out there getting facelifts, well over two hundred thousand, and these numbers. It'll be really interesting to see these numbers from twenty twenty two, just because you know there was some weirdness, obviously, in twenty twenty that definitely affected the numbers. Yeah. What was that again? I'm just just some weirdness. Yeah. I, something. Something happened in the world. I don't know. Yeah, with hospitals yeah. and people, and yeah, who knows? It was funny. Whatever I said, I was on my COVID brain oh, and yeah. I meant like COVID really distorted your be ability to look back in time. And you're like, you made it really clear that I did not have COVID. That's correct. Cause Definitely literally COVID brain COVID. is like a saying that people say it's a about thing. post COVID. So. Oh yeah. It's definitely a thing. So let's talk about the types of face and neck lifts. And I think this is where most people get totally lost in the woods and put way too much emphasis on the types of face and neck lifts, but to break it down into four very easy categories. Full versus mini, deep plane versus SMAS, direct excision, which is mostly for neck lifts, and then upper versus lower. And people get lost in the weeds on what is an upper facelift or a ponytail facelift or a lower facelift or a mini. I mean, like, so yeah, Dr. Martin, let's deep right. dive. Okay, we can deep dive into this, but just remember a lot of these terms are marketing terms. That's, yes, that's my point with all of this. They're made for the internet. Yes. They're made to draw you in, ponytail facelift, uh, Deep plane face yeah. lift. Yeah. Uh, well, lifestyle lift, oh. you know, all this kind of stuff. Lifestyle so lift. we're not going to entertain these marketing terms since this is an educational podcast meant to empower you if you're going to have a surgery like this so you understand exactly what's going on. So we're going to make this not confusing. We're going to make this very understandable. So you, if you're interested in these surgeries, could go into an office and, you know, kind of understand when the doctor is talking to you what they mean. So. Which is not to say we don't use these terms. We use all of them. In we fact, did. we even with one patient described what we were going to do on her as like a micro mini facelift. Yeah. Because it was such a There's little thing. There's sometimes you can't describe it. Yeah. Again, because you're an individual. So yes. first, Amy, full versus mini. So a full facelift um, can do exactly what it's stating. It covers the full aspects of your face. That's both the upper. Uh, the, like if you imagine the level of your eyes, you're going downwards to your cheeks, to your mouth and along your jawline, okay? That's not including a neck lift. Or a brow lift. Or a brow lift, but that's a full facelift. A mini facelift uh, covers the similar areas, but most likely will address more of the upper and middle face and not the lower jawline as much. So these are nuances, but definitely a mini facelift is gonna be less transformative overall than a full facelift. But someone might only need a mini. Yeah, so most, it equally as transformative. Most people would do well with just a mini or a less invasive facelift, but uh, it just depends on your presentation. And these two words mean no difference in downtime or recovery. Right. It's only about incision placement and length. So your downtime recovery, bruising, swelling, all that stuff is is not like minusculely different, like very little difference in those things. But you know, the incision is going to be different, but some of the underlying structure work happens more like with the Next one, the deep versus smash. So like once you get into working on the deeper parts of the face. Right. Now, we're still talking about the superficial parts. It's a good way to kind of ferret it out. Mm -hmm. um, there's also a full versus mini neck lift. Okay. The same idea. A full neck lift in many cases would put incisions, 
underneath your chin and involved elevating of skin of your entire front of your neck, whereas a mini neck lift would maybe be only on the sides or behind your ears. Yeah, it doesn't get to the muscle mm -hmm. as much as more addressing the skin only. The skin only with a little bit of muscle mm -hmm. pull on it. So a full versus mini really denotes the extensiveness of the skin undermining. And uh, this gets a little bit in the weeds when you get down to deep plane facelifts, but that, I think it's an easy way to look at it. Mm -hmm. So if you think in your mind that you need a mini facelift, it's gonna be less elevation of skin. That means less swelling, less bruising, most likely. But as Amy said, we have to be really clear on this. There's no difference in recovery mm -hmm. for between a, a full and a mini. It's just the mini kind of easier to get back out into public versus sort of, a full. Not necessarily. Not though. necessarily. It depends yeah. on the person. Yep. Second thing is deep plane versus SMAS. So Amy, since you never can remember, remember what SMAS stands for, why don't you explain the, the difference on this in your terms? In my terms. All right. This is what you do to fellows, you know, yeah. at the university. How would you to, describe yeah. this? Okay, Dr. Amy. Yeah, so basically it's just where you're making that dissection or the um, elevation of the muscle flap, essentially. So, right. So skin, you have your skin and that sags with age, but the stuff underneath also sags, the foundation of your face. And actually the foundation of your face, the stuff underneath, which includes muscles and soft tissue and fascia. And even bone. And yeah, I mean, you can go all the way down to the bone layer, but what we're talking about is that kind of muscle fascial layer. That sags too. And actually what we found over time or historically is that that foundation layer is way more important than the skin. And how did we find that out? In the 1980s and 90s, they didn't really address the foundation. They just pulled the skin really tight. And it looks uh, great right away. It looks, I don't even know if it looks great right <laughs> no, away. But you it just looks look fine really weird right away. And I'm trying to think of, think, can we think of someone in the 90s we know just had a skin only facelift that was pulled too tight, like a Phyllis Diller kind of person, maybe? Yeah. No, there were a lot. Um, there's like three fourths of the people listening to this podcast are really like, who the hell is Phyllis Diller? Well, I think you that know? it, it Do you was. Know what I'm yeah, it's so funny. Yeah, but thinking of anyone who had that very typical of the of the era plastic surgery look about them like where their face looked a little bit glassy and they looked a little bit windblown yeah like that's what caused that because they were pulling that skin so tight right and then actually the place where i trained i've said this before manhattan eye ear and throat hospital is where these kind of methods of doing facelifts changed and they realized very quickly that if you work on the foundation the structural part of your soft tissue not the bone uh, and you lift that uh, also, then you don't have to pull the skin as tight. The results last longer. They look more natural. It's just a better result. Yeah, and ultimately, I mean, with a well-done facelift, and this is what you realize by seeing it, once you've done that deeper work, and I tell patients this, they're like, oh, how much skin did he pull off? Like, it's not as much as you think because all you're getting rid of is the excess. Right. Like the overhang. It's like, you know, if you're recovering, I'm, here we go with the couch analogy again, if you're recovering like couch cushion or something or covering a cake with like fondant, you know, you, fondant. you cut sense. off the excess. But it's not fondant. Like I, I kind of yeah. like the fondant. Yeah. yeah. If you pull too hard, though, it's going to look weird. It's going to look weird. Yeah. yeah. So a deep plane actually addresses the foundation, but it does it underneath the foundation and actually elevates underneath the muscle layer and that fascial layer. Whereas a SMAS lift does a little bit of that, but usually uh, it's more superficial and you use plicating sutures or sutures that imbricate the muscle layer. Yeah, kind of from the top. The benefit of a deep plane facelift, which is getting more in vogue now, is you need less skin undermining, and you're really focusing on that foundation, which is important. Uh, the benefit of the SMAS is that you have a direct visualization of what you're doing because the skin is elevated, and you can really adjust fairly easily the uh, plication or the direction of where that pole goes. You can literally see it while you're doing it. Yeah. I like both of them. Uh, there's a, a street battle going on in aesthetic surgery right now. You got the deep plane gang and you got the SMAS gang. And, I think uh, the SMAS is more of a crew. Deep and, plane gang, yeah, SMAS and, crew. And, and the war is on the internet, like where everyone's like, I only do deep plane and that's the best thing ever. And I only do a SMAS lift. And again, the patients have no idea what any of this means. And then they're left confused because they go into an ENT surgeon and the facial plastic surgeons, which are ENT, ear, nose, and throat doctors, uh, notoriously love the deep plane facelift. That's the way they're taught. And the plastic surgeons more than likely do a SMAS lift. And everyone's saying something is better than the other. There's no true data on that. The studies that I know of that were done by some of the people that trained me shows that the outcomes are fairly similar. 
Well, and there is an additional risk with a deep plane in theory. Yeah. You know, that you are working a lot closer to some of those the nerves and other you know things that you. No, don't that's want to a be close le to. legitimate risk. Nerve injury, per the numbers, not per the skill or the surgeon himself or herself. Uh, deep plane facelifts have a higher incidence of nerve injury than a standard mastectomy. A nerve injury is the most devastating outcome to mm -hmm. a facelift. And clearly, if you're going to do an elective surgery, the last thing you want is a nerve injury yeah. uh, with the procedure itself. So that's something to think about. Obviously, people that do deep planes, and I do in some cases would do a deep plane, feel a lot more comfortable working around the nerves. And you, sh uh, you should be okay if they're board certified and skilled at the surgery. But my feeling about deep plane versus SMAS, just FYI, is that you need what you need. You don't just pick the highlighted surgery. You know, um, the well, example sorry. would be if you, if right now they're doing uh, robotic anterior approach hip replacements. Well, that's a really cool surgery, but if you don't need a hip replacement, why would you have it? it it's easier to understand in that kind of example, but it's the same thing here. Not everyone is a candidate for a deep plane. Well, how would someone know? Uh, it's hard. You have to, it's a clinical exam. Uh, if they do have a true redundancy of skin that has to be chased out somewhat, usually a mastectomy is going to be better because you're going to have to remove some of the excess skin. You can't just do a lift alone and not remove the skin if you have a lot of excess skin. Uh, but, you know, that depends on age. Maybe a deep plane might be better for a younger person, whereas uh, a standard mastectomy would be better for an older person. But, I mean, it can vary per patient to patient. So, and there's a lot of other things on top of that that get more clinically complicated, which I'm not going to get into, but. Yeah. So I maybe it's best for the patient not to decide what they need. Right. But <laughs> I do like the idea. I, I do like, I mean, this is, I'm being honest. I like when patients are like, oh, I really am into this deep plane. So it, then I can talk to them about the foundation, mm -hmm. you know, so it gives me an opportunity to educate them, even if they're not a candidate for it. So, but unfortunately, yeah, you're right. My friend went to so-and-so and he does deep plane. He said, that's the only way to do it. Every other way is terrible. So. Right. Um, but the, the, the true, the truth for both of these approaches is you have to address the foundation. A skin only lift is not going to offer, offer you the longevity of this surgery. So it's very important for you as the patient to, to ensure that if you're going to do a facelift or even a neck lift, that the foundation is addressed mm -hmm. also. Yeah. One of the things I did not address in this podcast, we talk about it more, I think in your perfect facelift, we talk about the, uh, threading. You know, because it's not a facelift regardless of how they market it. And those are things that kind of address neither. Like they're not removing skin in most cases. They're kind of pulling its skin, but it's not a long lasting result. It's really, mm -hmm. you know, that, yeah. And I always wonder, like, do the threads actually go through some of the SMAS layer? I'm sure they do. They must have, they have to anchor it to something. Something, so yeah. To fascia. Yeah, it's interesting. But I mean, we've seen those extrude. I mean, the patients who we've done surgeries on who have those threads they in place. They just don't last. They don't last. They don't last. I mean, that's no. the problem. I mean, that you may look good for six months to a year, but they just don't last. They I mean, what's the point? Last. You're going to spend yeah. three or $4,000 on something that or doesn't more. last. Yeah. And then you've got all this thread material in your face and it can have problems. You yeah. can extrude and them. And you like, can get infected. Yeah. It can make you look weird. And then the worst part is, is I'm the guy that gets stuck going back in there trying Cutting to make them, them look out. better. And then yeah. I have to cut, kind of go through all those threads. Yeah. Now, most of them are absorbable, but they do have some permanent ones and uh, again, we're not throwing thread lifting under the bus, but it's just really it's just not a true facelift. It does, it's not a facelift. So why, how it's why compare it yeah, it's to a not. facelift? That's why it doesn't make yeah. this podcast. It's not comparable. So we kind of we addressed we'll skip to upper lower because we kind of did address that when we were talking about full versus mini. And that's you know, people still do ask about an upper facelift. And I think most of those people, when they're saying that, what they really mean is a brow lift. You know, that it was yeah. very rare that people do like the chronal facelifts, right, where they would just that's like, what they used to do in the 90s. Yeah. An incision from ear to ear. Mm -hmm over the crown of your head. Yep. Could you imagine? Might as well call that, what would they call that, the headband? That's basically facelift. what they do for like brain, you know, for yeah. brain tumors and things like that. It's called a coronal incision or bicoronal incision. I mean, that was like standard. And then they would take out a strip of your hair from yeah. ear to ear and then sew it back together. And then, yeah, and then you would have this- Odd hairline. <laughs> like a scar that yeah. literally would go from ear to ear. You used to always wear a headband for the rest Could of your Could you imagine? Life. And you get out of the pool and your hair parts like- <laughs> Right, like front and yeah. back. I mean, it's so terrible. Yeah. Yeah. I tell you what, though, they work. Like, they do not move, you know? And if you do too much, and you you know it. But um, obviously, uh, especially with brow lifts, we've gone to a lot lesser invasive approaches. Mm -hmm. And I only do a skin lift for the brows, which is different than the face. You don't have to do foundations for the brows. Because yeah. uh, truly, it's just um, a skin structure, yep. which is hair in a certain area of your skin and you want to place that 
uh, in a kind of location that is aesthetically better. And uh, we do little small skin incisions in the office under local anesthesia. So you think about that, 30 years we've gone from making an incision from ear to ear that goes over the top of your head <laughs> under general anesthesia and, and they literally do the, sorry, Nils, the face off thing where they pull the, the whole we forehead down and time then time lift too. it back up to a small little skin incision that you could do under local anesthesia. So it just shows you, you know, things are becoming more less invasive, which obviously I think the deep plan could be considered in some ways less invasive. Or more. Or more, yeah. yeah. And then but in th that same vein of skin only, we have direct neck excision. Right. Which and we then, have a whole podcast episode on too. That, that's a little bit of a misnomer because the direct neck excision, you can actually do a platysmoplasty, which is the deeper muscle layer. So like the face, this is important for us to talk about, there's a, found, a muscle f kind of fascial foundation, it's more muscle on the neck that connects to this quote unquote smass layer, let's call it the platysma, platysma muscle. That's the neck muscle. Nils's neck muscle, his platysma muscle is very strong in Nordic people. Look at yours, yours rolling. Yeah. Yep. So that's how you shave. You'll see men stick out their lower lip and really tighten up their neck. That's the platysma muscle. It doesn't make sense when you do that. It actually like makes your neck. Okay. It, it well, would seem you're, you're not a man. So I'm not a man. I would think maybe you you're not shaving your back. neck. No, I'm not. No one cares about your <laughs> yeah. input on this. <laughs> I have okay, never you, shaved my neck. You may have. I have not. I don't know. You're kind of a weird person. You grew up in Breckenridge <laughs> in the mountains. God knows what you were doing. So uh, that platysma muscle can uh, also, you know, get looser over time. It can get something called vertical banding, which we've talked about many times before. The platysma muscle meets in the midline of your neck underneath your chin, and that can spread apart. And so you get these vertical bands, and it people have seen that. A little bit. Yeah, and then with the excess skin, it really destroys the contour of your neck underneath your chin, makes you look older. So through a direct excision neck lift we can actually tighten the muscles, the platysma muscles in the midline. And we do that in a corset fashion. Uh, we can also do that in an open or full neck lift with an incision underneath the chin. On the sides, behind the ears, we actually take that platysma muscle, which ends or demarcates around the area of your ear lobe. We take a suture and actually grab the edge of that platysma muscle on the outside and really sling it back and up uh, behind your ear to really define the jawline and your neck itself. So the, there is a muscle component to the neck lift, which is really important. And to be honest with you, makes the biggest difference on the transformation. Yeah, especially if you if you need a full neck lift and you don't get one. So if you only have the skin, and we tell patients this, you know that banding will just pull at that skin more, and you'll, yeah. you'll it. It's not fixing everything. Right, and if you just do a skin only neck lift, FYI, without liposuction, without a Muzzle, uh, muscle, muscle, without a muzzle, muscle. Uh, without a muscle tightening procedure along with it, it'll be good for the first month, two or three months, and then it'll start to slowly relax. We see tons of patients like that where they only had skin only procedures and they're just disappointed because their results don't last. And that's why ultimately, if you do this stuff a lot, you really try as hard as you can to do foundational work, no matter where you are even if the patients really are marginally a candidate for it because it ensures longevity and it ensures better results. So any foundational work you can do within reason you should do. Yeah, so people are all thinking like, I need a full everything. Well, so let's say a patient has had a full neck lift in 10 years, they probably just need a mini. Yeah. That muscle repair is probably still intact. Totally. Or if they're very young, you know, that 30 to 45 range, like they might be able to get away with just a mini knowing that they will absolutely have a full in five to 10 years. Right. You know? And that's the other part of this caveat. Just because you start with a mini doesn't mean you won't get a full right. in the future. Or just because you start with a full doesn't mean you'll need a mini in the future. And, you know, that's why it's so confusing to people because they want to be they want to group themselves. It's human nature to want to group yourself into a group, right? That's why politics is so annoying. So it's the same thing in aesthetics. Like they want to feel like I'm like this. Well, it's, it's it doesn't work that way. Everyone's so unique. I mean, it's, there's so many different presentations that I see all the time. Some people present and they have marionette lines that come down from the edge of their mouth, right? And that's their only problem. Other people, their cheeks are descended. Other people, their jaw lines are ill-defined. Other people just have fat and loose skin underneath their chin. A really severe band. Some people have really kind of heavy brows that that kind of proceed over to the temporal area, the area next to your eyes. And it's 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 so that's why I love this part of plastic surgery. It's just very unique. I mean, a breast dog in some ways is a breast dog. If you come in, you have lack of volume, you need to add volume to it. But face and neck lifts have so many nuances to them. 
which is why also you don't see a lot of people doing it because it takes a lot of brain power and a lot of effort and uh, focus. And people sometimes, even surgeons, it gets hard for them after a while. And they're like, ah, this isn't worth it, right? Well, that's weak in my mind. Well, they're coming at it, I think, the wrong way. You know, I think, honestly, yeah. I, th- I feel like you have found more calm in facelifts. Oh, yeah, 100%. Yeah, practice. maybe I'm the dysfunctional one. I don't think so. I love it. Yeah. The refinement. Like you, I mean, like, I feel like you find calm in facelifts oh, that you t- didn't Oh, totally, have totally. All my obsessive, yeah. compulsive type A-ness just comes out through my hands. It's yeah. like, it's like better than any pill you could ever give someone who has my type of brain. Yeah. And you get to, it all comes out during the surgery. But that's not. Yeah, that's true. That's a better way to put it. Mm-hmm. People that do this for a living plastic surgery, maybe they're not made up that way. Maybe they're more of a macro person instead mm-hmm. of a micro person. So, yeah. Anyways, direct excision neck lift. Uh, we've had an episode on this. We have multiple things on our Instagram, I think, our social media stuff about it, which is basically an incision underneath the chin from the chin down to the base of your neck. And it's for people that aren't candidates for a full neck lift or maybe aren't candidates for a full neck lift because of medical issues. And it's primarily done in men, but women are candidates. And it's an easy surgery that we do in the office, takes 45 minutes. And we'll show you an example of that. Yeah. So I think the funniest thing, you know, coming back like more to the patient side of things is when I will send someone a quote that says face or neck lift on it. Oh, and they'll send me back like, no, no, no. Dr. Martin said it was a mini. You know, and I, that's where you're saying with like people getting caught up in the the verbiage, like to them, even in somebody's intake, you know, they'll say, you know, I'll say, you've had a facelift before. Like, oh, no, I had a mini. <laughs> like, yeah, you've had a facelift. So there's a part after mini. <laughs> these words don't matter. Ultimately, like Dr. Warren said, like you need the surgery you need. You are probably not the best judge of that. Going to a board certified plastic surgeon will help you determine that. But arguing with them over whether you need a full or a mini or a deep plane or a smass, like, it, it, none of that matters. Yeah, but I guess mini, what's a, like a mini Cooper? If I said I ha, I own a mini, then you would know it's a mini Cooper. It was not a Volkswagen Vanagon. Right. <laughs> or some type of like. Uh, so I, I, get, I get why someone would just say mini. It should say mini on it. But a mini is a technically a facelift. Uh, a mini neck lift is tec- Still a neck tec- lift. Tec- technically a neck lift. Even a direct excision. When I send those quotes, they say neck lift. It says neck lift so. direct excision. So. Get the facelift you need based on the surgeon you've chosen because you trust this person because they are a board certified plastic surgeon that you like. <laughs> Look at their results. Doesn't matter what we call it. You need the surgery you need. Yeah. Like exactly. You could actually give it your own name as right. long as he like or she is very mini. good and has good judgment and good technical ability. I literally put that on a quote, like micro, micro mini. mini. That's what this person needed. It was like, it really was. See, like we, I wish mini. we were more like that because we would be more savvy with the internet, like yeah. buzzwords. Yeah, micro mini face. Yeah, micro. Micro I, mini I, Hi, my name is Dr. Martin. I'm a micro mini right. surgeon. I don't know if you want to say that. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Let's talk about... A couple of things. We're going to talk in more detail about this. But you just made me feel really uncomfortable. Like where the incisions go. We're just going to let that go. Okay. We're just going to go to the next slide. <laughs> yeah, moving on. So we have these two pictures saved on our Instagram channel, uh, at Jason Martin MD under the save stories. I think it's actually the first save story where Dr. Martin shows this in action. So it's kind of talking about the where the incisions go, but also the, the movement of the skin and the foundation. So the picture... And I think this is actually a good two things. The kind of dashed dotted black line is ultimately where we're dissecting to, which might seem, you know, if you could see the whole face, it seems like a pretty big area. I mean, it's going to, you know, on some people it's an Go area. Go down to your mid cheek. Yeah, yeah. It starts from your um, sideburn area, goes down to your mid cheek and then wraps around in a curvilinear fashion to behind your ear. Yeah. So that's a lot of skin. It is. And, yeah. o- and obviously on a deep plane, you would have less skin than that. Also, yeah. if you look on this picture on our YouTube channel, You'll see the uh, markings around the ear is where the incision is placed. And this is really well hidden in front of the helix, which is the top part of your ear. It goes behind the tragus, which we always refer to it the same way. That yeah. That's what Amy pushes in when I talk to her so she doesn't hear me. Yeah. Yeah. Hear it. Why are your <laughs> like, fingers you going say? in your ears? <laughs> I didn't hear that. I'm your coworker. Why aren't you listening to me? <laughs> like I heard, I heard nothing yeah, you said. She's like, I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Yeah. And then the marking goes down in front of your lobule or your ear lobe. And there's a crease there naturally. And then it goes behind your ears, which you rarely would ever see, even if you're walking behind somebody. So Yeah, the they, incision is nowhere near this thick. You're right. But it does show it to yeah. you well. And it's very interesting how well in competent hands, at least in our experience in our office, these incisions heal. I mean, you can see these people two weeks later two weeks later and it's barely visible. Mm-hmm. And that's not like it for every surgery we do, like tummy tucks and stuff. And they take longer to heal and 
they tend to get more red over time. There's a lot of tension on them. There's not as much tension on these. Uh, and looking in this picture, uh, I'm annoyed the way I drew the arrows. Um, they're not symmetric. No, they're not. And uh, one of the tails of the arrow is, is a little bit irregular. So if I had my druthers, I would go back and touch up this picture. So, But we don't do that. I'm not going to so. look at it. Yeah. yeah. No, but it is good because it shows you the the – Vector of pull. And that's really yeah. important. Unless about we vector have a pull. cool video yeah. of this. So the next, if you go through the stories. Like oh, is this going to show the video itself? It will when they look at the story. Oh, awesome. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I wish, well, should I like dictate the video, even no. though I'm not looking at the video? No. <laughs> I think the important thing here is that when you, you know, people tend to pull straight up on everything. And that is not the way a face and neck lift is pulled. It is pulled back and out, not up. And we've said this many times before. If you want to know the vector of pull, when you look in the mirror and move your skin around, most likely you're doing it in the direction that I do it because you not always. We have some patients so, do some yeah. weird stuff. Most people don't want to look weird. Yeah. So they're, they're like, can again? you go in this direction? And it was like, yeah, exactly. That's what I do in the operating room. I just really am adjusting back and forth, looking with my eyes to see what I like the best. I did that today uh, in our uh, in office awake facelift that we did today. Um, and you'll see in most cases, so if you imagine that you have a face and neck lift, so we'll, we'll say a full face and neck lift, um, the vector of pull for the skin in front of the ear is more up and out. And the vector of pull for the skin behind the ear is more straight out, in rare cases down, but it's more straight out, sometimes a little bit up, okay? So you're lifting the front of the ear up and back a little bit more, and you're lifting behind the ear mostly back. And the reason that is, is because your vector of pull for behind the ear is really trying to address what, Amy? Underneath the chin. Mm -hmm. So lifting up would not address underneath the chin, would uh, address. And it can also leave some weird wrinkling on the front of right. the ear. Would address like going down your neck to your mm -hmm. collarbone. And then what are you trying to address with the front of the ear pull? You're trying to address the jawline, but more importantly, the face, the cheeks and everything else. And that we prefer, if you look in the mirror, going up and out is better than straight like this. Yeah, or even up. But yeah. I say that, and like every third case, I'm always like having a different vector of pull. And what's even crazier is the foundation work we talked about before has a different vector of pull mm -hmm. than the skin. Yeah, you're pulling it more up. Yeah. Yep. And uh, that's why you can't cookbook this stuff, right? That's why you can't say, okay, every single time I'm going to pull the foundation this way, the foundation has to go to uh, the, in the direction of pull, depending on what you see. And today, we had a vector of pull for the foundation that was more vertical or up toward the top of your head because she was having problems both on the jawline and the marionette lines. So I found that very interesting. If you want to get the nasolabial folds, the line between your nose and your mouth, you may have more of a lateral or uh, pull of the foundation to the outside toward your ear. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, it's, it's just so unique per each person. You know, that, that bony structure really makes a difference there too. You know, someone who has a very ill-defined jawline, you're going to want to pull slightly differently than someone who has a very prominent jawline. So those things all matter. And this picture, you, know, you kind of see that Dr. Martin has the two clamps. And in the video, you see that he kind of shows that difference in the angle. Because if you pull it the wrong way, like that's where things end up starting to look a little bit off. Mm -hmm. So Yeah. And um, when you do face and neck lifts, you want to make the soft tissue look better, but you're utilizing the bony landmarks mm -hmm. as really a guide to, to how you can use your vector of pull. And the problem is with age, um, we get osteoporosis. Again, we've talked about all these things before, and osteoporosis is a real problem, and it affects your jawbone, which is not a small bone. Mm -hmm. And especially in women, they, they have unpronounced jawbones, uh, underdeveloped chins, uh, their maxilla or their midface is you know less pronounced. And Therefore, when you have age-related changes, it's more obvious. That's why someone like me, who is a more prominent jaw-like. And just most men in like general. A more prominent jaw-like. Like Lee Marvin. Like Lee Marvin. <laughs> I think Shout out to whoever left that comment. About someone left a Dr. comment Martin that looked I look like, like Lee, Marvin, Lee Marvin, who was a famous actor from like, the 50s. I think it was actually like the 40s. I mean, the 40s. <laughs> who knows? 40s, 50s. Uh, yeah. But like, you know, someone like me who has a more prominent jawline. That's beneficial, aesthetically speaking, because I have more purchase, have more st structure there, just like a house, like a foundation of a house. If you have less of a foundation, then any kind of changes to that house, superficially speaking, the walls and stuff are, are going to be more problematic overall to the to the appearance of the house itself. So 
I think that um, you have to look at yourself as a gestalt from top to bottom in every layer, skin, foundation, and then bone. And then uh, along with that, when you get into kind of higher level facial aesthetics, you're, you're looking at the fat pads too, the volume the malar fat pads, the fat pads that you know, are the fat that or soft tissue that's present near the jawline and the tethering ligaments that are there and how those interact. So it's really, really interesting. Uh, it's not worth going into those complicated things on a podcast like this because it's not going to help you in terms of your decision making. But the vector of pull where will when you look in the mirror and you move your fingers on your skin like everyone does before they come in. And you do it in a direction that looks pretty normal and it gets rid of all the problems, the lines around your mouth, the nasal labial fold somewhat, that makes the jawline look better. That's probably the direction of pull that we're going to do in the operating room. Yeah. Then just know that it was 50% less than however hard you're pulling on yourself. Yeah. That's the other thing. <laughs> Everyone pulls where they have no wrinkles. Yeah. And can't turn their head yeah. or move or look up or down. Yeah. So just know however hard you're pulling, it's probably 50% of that. And that's more realistic. All right. Let's talk quickly about who's a candidate before we take a quick break. So we talk a lot about who is a candidate for surgeries. In this case, it's pretty easy. If you're healthy enough for surgery and facial aging, male or female, you are probably a candidate for some version of face or neck lift. Yeah. E even as we saw in the statistics in people in their late 20s. So See how you say statistics, like when you don't think about it, it's perfect. It comes out. Yeah. I just can't think about it. Maybe we need to do like, you know how some people that have speech impediments, they are uh, speech problems. They put those earphones on mm -hmm. that like plays background music. We need to do that with you or sounds. Right. <laughs> during the podcast. I don't think that's going to work. Is that going to work? Okay. No. No, it just uh, occasionally comes out correctly okay, that's when good. I don't think about yeah. it. So that's yeah, I mean, easy. So uh, age-related changes mm -hmm. to the face and neck. If you're healthy and you have those, you're probably a candidate for these procedures. Like there is Legit. something. Yep. Now, there are specialty or special kind of circumstances you're not. If you have diabetes and it's uncontrolled, if you have wound healing issues, if you're on chronic steroids, you have... Um, Uncontrolled, uncontrolled like rheumatoid blood pressure. disease, yeah, yeah, rheumatoid disease, and you're on steroids or some sort of anti-inflammatory medication long term. The things that make you not a candidate for elective surgery also make you not a candidate for elective surgery. Right, but those are few and far between. And even in the cases of, say, let's say rheumatoid disease, we have a lot of patients with rheumatoid disease that we still do face and neck lifts, but it takes a lot of work. We have to work with their rheumatologists, we, they, they usually get injections or once a month. We have to time the surgery around the injections, et cetera, et cetera. We have to talk to the patients that are at higher risk for wound healing issues and infections. It's a whole process. By the way, I'm a real doctor and Amy works with a real doctor. So we actually do the preoperative exams. We actually get preoperative clearance. We actually talk to your primary care physician. We actually look at your cardiac clearance. We do everything like that. So. I know that's not sexy. That maybe is not good for social media either, but. Well, it's pretty good to hear when you actually wake up from surgery. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. Um, and some of that's for the anesthesia and stuff, which I guess we'll get to later. But, I, it, you know, these even though these are elective surgeries, and again, they're fairly low risk surgeries in the right hands, um, they still require, you know, vetting. You still require vetting. You still require someone to look through your past medical history and to make sure you're, you're a candidate. And I, I've had experiences where some patients get a little bit annoyed. They're like, why are you like getting all into my medical business? I'm like, because it's my Because I'm going to do surgery on it's you. It's my responsibility. Yeah. Yeah. They don't mean it meanly, but I, you know, it's like a disconnect. Like right? we're just going to take your word for it that you're perfectly healthy. Yeah. Like they yeah. walked into the whatever store and I'm supposed to just have fun. You know, this is like, oh, pull out some mimosas and we're just going to do surgery. No, it just doesn't work like that. Unfortunately, I wish that we could have that element, but it's not like that. Uh, this is, you know, you go into these doctor's offices, they're going to do their due diligence on you as a patient. They it's should. If it's they're not, that's a problem. It's absolutely mandatory. Yeah. Yeah. That's the case with any surgery. We're, we don't just take somebody's word for it, that they're perfectly healthy right. when we're going to put them to sleep and do surgery on them. Have you ever yeah. talked to anyone about their health? And if you know anything about medicine, usually they're wrong. Usually something comes out wrong and it's not even intentional, you know? No, nope. it's um, complicated. Yeah, it's very complicated. Yeah. So if you are, you know, have age-related changes or even just changes to your face and neck that could be improved with a face and neck lift or direct excision neck lift, then you're probably a candidate if you're healthy. Yes. All right. Let's take a quick break. Hear a word from our sponsor, Let's Get Checked, and we'll be back. We'll be right back. 
Dr. Martin, I'm super excited to talk about our sponsor for this podcast. Let's get checked. You, If you've been a listener of our podcast, you know that we have never had a sponsor before, and that's because we're an educational podcast. We're not looking to monetize, and we also would never recommend something that we didn't believe in and or use ourselves. So basically, you're saying we're very choosy. We're very choosy yeah. when we come to our less good... Or we're testing, but yeah. let's get checked is really aligns with our values. We talk a lot about monitoring your blood values of certain things. We talked recently about vitamin D serum levels. We talk a lot about hormone levels and it's hard for some people to get to a lab or you're afraid of the blood draw or just, you know, you're concerned about confidentiality. Like you have a lot of concerns and you just don't do it. Let's get checked makes it super easy because it's completely confidential. You do it from your home. So there's really no excuse not to do it. Yeah. And we did it recently. Both Amy and I did it. She looked at her women's health, um, basically her hormone levels. And I looked at mine on the men's health side with testosterone. It was very simple. You go online, their online um, interface is really easy to use and good. Uh, we got the testing kit very quickly and the test itself, actually doing the stick, you do a stick on the end of your finger is not hard to do. It only took about three to four minutes. You put it back in a sealed envelope that's confidential, goes back to them. You get your results in two to five days. It's really that simple. And the best part is it's about empowerment, about you taking control and trying to do things that are positive for your health and life. And this is one way to do it literally from the comfort of your own home. Yeah, so they offer a wide range of tests. So they do men's and women's hormone panels. They do a full panel of STD testing. They also are now offering a COVID-19 test at home. So there are a lot of other just basic blood levels that you can get tested as well. And one of the things that we always say is you can't track what you don't check. So you might not know what's normal for you in the future if you're not checking it now, especially as it relates to hormones and men's health specifically, I feel like is a little bit under treated. I mean, oh, yeah. you know, sperm crowns are dropping by a large percentage in men these days. Most men um, struggle at some point in their lifetime with low testosterone. And those men do not know what the symptoms of low testosterone are. Depression, anxiety, sleep problems, osteopenia or loss of bone, loss of muscle and something we treat all the time, gynecomastia or male breast growth. These are real problems that can be been, you know, that can be improved or treated with testosterone. And these men do not know their levels. It's so easy to get checked. And this is why we're so excited about the sponsor. Yeah. And let's get checked as a completely CLIA certified lab, the CIL CLIA lab. So they're a well-established, completely safe lab to use. You do get contacted after, so you get your results. I got a text at 4.30 in the morning, which I loved, uh, that my results were ready. And we're both up at 4.30, yep, so, so that I was, was good. Super excited. And you have access to a, not only a nurse, but also a physician. So a physician does review your results. And it gives you a little breakdown of like where you're sitting on those levels. Um, Dr. Martin's had even comparisons of like where two of the levels should be in relation to each other, which is a really important thing to note. Right. You know, Just being within the normal range is not always enough. So it really gave more information than that you'd still want to, of course, reach out to your own doctor if you needed some additional assistance with these labs or you did see something that was concerning. Um, we didn't, thankfully. So that was good. Yeah, yeah. We, were all, we were both good. You know, this podcast is about empowerment. It's educational in my private practice. I'm a board certified plastic surgeon. We are all about empowerment and this is one way to do it. So we're very excited about the sponsorship and we're looking forward to using it for our patients moving forward. Yeah, so as a listener of our podcast, if you're also a new time user to Let's Get Checked, which a lot of you probably are, we do have a 20% discount code. So you do need to go to our specific URL and it is linked in the description box below, but it's going to be try LGC, so T R Y L G C like let's get checked dot com slash beauty B E A U T Y and you'll need to use the code beauty twenty at checkout. Beauty again is B E A U T Y twenty two zero. And you can pick a test, like any test you'd like, put in our code and get your test shipped to you. Getting tested is the right thing to do. It's uh lets you know where you're at and what's responsible. All right. Well let's get tested. Let's get tested. Let's get checked. Let's get checked. Yeah. <laughs> We're back. This is where it gets a little fun because we're going to talk some about downtime recovery and then we're going to look at pictures. So if you've been waiting for the pictures, they are coming. Right. It's like the, uh, who was it? It was not Elmo. It was Grover, the monster at the end of this book. You, your kids are way too young for that. But anybody, monster at the end of this book? Every page it was Grover. And he's like, you know, don't turn the page. And he's like building a brick wall the whole time. Like, whatever you do, don't turn the next page. Of course you would. And he'd freak out. And then you get to the very last page, the monster at the end of the book was him. It was Grover all along. <laughs> Right. Totally yeah. spoiled it. Man, that is like a parable. Yep. You know? Kaiser Sose. Yeah, yep. yeah. <laughs> he was the monster at the end of the book. So the pictures are coming. Hold yeah, hold on for just a little bit of downtime recovery talk and then we'll start showing pictures. Yeah. So downtime recovery. We talked is, a lot about this in the myth busting. We did. But things, you know, big things, you know, that people need to know about are the primary things that put pain, sutures, bruising, and swelling. 
pain is subjective, but yes, there will be discomfort with this procedure. Is it a painful procedure? For 99.9% .9 of people, I would say they have minimal, minimal discomfort or pain. There is pain, especially the first day and a half when you have the drains in place and you're wrapped really tight, like that can be that can be truly painful. After drain removal, it is rare that a patient complains about pain that is bothersome. Like they might have intermittent discomfort and they definitely have tightness, but not true like pain pain. Yeah, so we saw a few of our facelift patients yesterday, right? A week out, were they a week out? Or they were two. That? Well, they were like 10 days. 10 days. They were all, yeah, 10 days. So they were 10 days out and they were doing great. Yeah, back to work, back. I mean, one of them was back to a busy job, you know, so they people are back to life pretty quickly after a face and neck lift. You will have sutures for I tell people to plan seven to 10 days. We take out some sutures sometimes at like five days and leave some till 10. You know, usually you hit somewhere in the middle. So yes, those sutures are visible in most cases. They're also annoying. You have staples. But by, you know, 10 days, you're suture and staple free. Bruising and swelling is also kind of like pain. It's a little bit person dependent. Now it's not so subjective. And then if you have bruising, you have bruising. <laughs> it's not like you can think that away, but bruising and swelling is gonna vary person to person. We have patients who have very little swelling and very little bruising or even no bruising in rare cases. And then we have other patients who like swell aggressively like a troll doll and bruise like crazy, look like they went 12 rounds. So I tell people to expect bruising and to expect swelling for at least four weeks. And then when their bruising is gone at 10 days, they're happy. <laughs> Under promise, over deliver. Yes. Yeah, that's the way Amy does. And with bruising, you just don't know. I mean, we did also see a patient yesterday who is almost a month out from surgery and she still has pretty significant bruising because she's on some blood thinners, you know? So like there's things that might make you bruise more than someone yeah. else. She's a special circumstance because she's on legitimate blood thinners. Yeah. And by the way, you can do surgeries on blood thinners, but it takes a lot of work for the surgeon because you have to stop them and you have to get clearance or and bridge with something else bridge with something else so you know it's most patients we, we would say no to that but there's there are some healthy patients that have you know kind of a very stable medical background even though they require anticoagulation or blood thinning medications that can't are candidates but it's kind of few and far between yeah social downtime is going to be the i think the biggest outlier for most people because it depends on your comfort level so much I and mean, we have patients who are back to doing social activities with friends going out to lunch with friends going to dinner going to events even we had a patient who a week after her facelift unfortunately had to do a big photo shoot that was not supposed to be for like several more weeks but for whatever reason it got moved way up you know and you make it work but your social downtime is likely the the biggest factor of recovery you know, if you have a big event planned, like a wedding or a graduation or somewhere where your picture is going to be taken, you know, that's where you really need to plan. Like People the get so weeks. angst ridden about that. I feel like it's awesome because like I struggle socially. I don't want to go out. I would love to just have an excuse that I could stay inside for three weeks and watch, you know, really cool documentaries and read books and listen to music. I Instead mean, of going out to dinner. Well, but if you had something like your daughter's graduation is in several months. Well, like, that would do a facelift right before. Exactly. Yeah. That's my point. Yeah. Like. It's planning around events that you might have that becomes more challenging. Work slash life, you know, most people are back to life activities with some restrictions a couple of days after couple surgery. Couple of days, yeah. You know, you may not be able to drive for a week or so. You're obviously not doing like your spring cleaning of your house the two days after surgery, but you know, responding to emails, chatting with your kids or grandkids or whatever on the phone. I mean, you're back to normal life things very quickly, walking right away. Yeah, I wouldn't FaceTime your grandkids like day three after a facelift. Depends on the person. They might start crying and think that Meemaw got beat up by Paw Paw. But see, it's just that people don't look at us like, we, I mean, as long as you're acting okay to a child, they're going to think you're fine. That's a good point. I mean, like, yeah. you, kids have boo-boos all the time. Like, yeah. you say you have a boo-boo and you're fine. Like, and you're Mima not acting. has a boo-boo all over her face. <laughs> don't worry. <laughs> you're making it seem like bruising is really aggressive. <laughs> no, I know. Not. I'm just laughing yeah. that yeah. she's trying to explain it away yeah. on day three. We did have a patient like that recently. Actually, it was in the past couple of weeks. She loves to FaceTime her grandkids, like a big part of what she does. And she was very concerned about how they would feel. She said that to me. I said, you'll be fine. And she was fine. Yeah. Her grandkids are at a weird age. They're yeah. like in their like nine and 11, I think. So they are at an age where they would notice. Oh, okay. Yeah, I thought they were younger. Why. No, I they were, they were yeah. old. That's, that, they were at a weird age. If they were like five, like who cares? They'd be like, yeah. you're fine. Uh, work depends on what you do for work. You know, we have a lot of patients who are back to work the very, like two days after surgery, they're back to working from home. We even have patients... Again, we have a lot of patients who have very active lives, you know, who maybe work in real estate. This is a good example who all of a sudden get an opportunity to show a house three days after surgery well, and they do it. it. They are doing yeah. it. <laughs> You're not passing that paycheck. No, on. like you do it. You know, these, 
I'm you'll noticing see, some swelling around your face. That's no, nothing. People don't look at us like that. It was that. a laser treatment. Yeah, yeah. I always tell people, you had dental work done. Yeah. You know, like there's a lot of ways to explain like slight bruising. If someone asks, and again, most people aren't going to ask unless they know you very well and know what you've had done. I mean, they don't care. Yeah. All, jo- all joking aside, these people really don't look that weird mm-hmm. after surgery. Now, you can have, if you do a brow lift, a full face and neck lift, an upper and lower blepharoplasty right. or eyelids, that's a totally different yeah. story. But if you're talking just an isolated face and neck lift, Within your female, and you can wear your, and you have longer hair, you can wear it down. Or you're a man that just doesn't bruise. Or, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. And men too. Yeah. Uh, you, you probably could go out in most situations and people aren't going to be staring at you because they think you look different or weird. Yeah. And people just, we're, don't we're so self centered. I mean, people really don't care. They just I, don't that's, care. that's really the base. I care about you, Amy, but I don't. They right. Don't care a a random, would you, like you're in a grocery store and you see somebody. I mean, we would notice that they'd have surgery, but like, do you think other you know, the only care? person would notice is Nils because he's now after he, episode yeah, he, he knows 100. This. What is this, 134 he's an episodes now? Doctor. Yeah. Honorary yeah. surgeon. He, he is. I mean, he's basically a plastic surgeon. Like 134 episodes. That's probably 134 hours of learning about plastic oh, surgery. Far more. You know how many times he's had to listen to each episode? Like over yeah, and over and over again. Oh, yeah. <laughs> He's up to his 10,000 hours now. So basically, though, you'll be back to most of your normal work life kind of activities really quickly, especially ones that are not for, like I say forward facing. So if you're not in a situation where you're right in front of a person, you'll be back to those activities very quickly. Yep. Exercise and travel. These are the other two that people always ask me about. When can I exercise? When can I travel? Travel depends on where you're going and who your surgeon is. We obviously have patients who travel to us for surgery. So when they can travel home is maybe different than when we'd say it's OK for you to travel abroad. You know, sometimes they live abroad, but meaning like a big vacation. Mm -hmm. I usually tell people not to plan major travel for six weeks. You know, that's because you're going to still have restrictions on things like swimming, which despite what Dr. Martin thinks, people love to swim. Oh, my God. Or scuba dive or whatever. So just take every chance you get to talk about swimming. It's a dumb podcast. People ask me about swimming on a daily basis. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> exercise you know we want I'm you just up so annoyed with you right now and walking right away but intense this, exercise. This, this experience this podcast experience would be perfect if you would stop talking about swimming patients ask me you've been there when they've asked i me. have never heard a patient ask about swimming ever the patient we did pre-up on today when we did her pre-up on the video remember she's going to mexico in three weeks yeah. and want to know if she could wakeboard okay mm-hmm. Besides that one. Yep. <laughs> and besides when, and, today. And when we besides were having, something that literally just happened two hours <laughs> right. ago. And when we were having that conversation, we brought up the, the patient of ours who does the like crazy parasailing and like, yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, we have parasailing. We have paragliding. We have parachuting. Lots of scuba Like who divers. are these people? Yeah. So, I don't know what it is about Colorado. It's just like all these crazy like uh, activities and they do it on a regular basis. It's not like, hey, I'm going to go out. This is like one time in my life. I'm going to jump out of a plane. They like do it every week. So. So, yeah, exercise is going to depend on what you do for exercise. But for the most part, you'll be cleared for all exercise at six weeks with some restrictions that get less and less from the day of surgery up until that six week mark. Most of the things are kind of intuitive, like things where your head is going to be below your heart. People who do a lot of yoga, that can be a challenge for. Or you're Pilates. Laying flat. Yeah, Pilates. Pilates is a pretty easy one at like two to three weeks to get around. You know, there's not a lot of inversions in Pilates and you can lay flat at that point. There is so. on the reformer when they do the hands. If you're doing the trapeze stuff, yes. Yeah. But on a regular reformer, you're pretty much flat for a lot of it unless you're doing a lot of upper body stuff. Yeah. Yeah. If you're doing f- like core and legs. I feel like they do the, when they do the core work, they put the arms up at the top and then your head's kind of down and then you push the reformer seat down with your knees. Yeah. And that can be modified yeah. to keep your neck more neutral. Like there's yeah. a lot of modifications and a lot of exercises if you have a good relationship with the person who you're taking yeah, those classes from. Yeah, that should be hard. Yeah. yeah. Sleep is the one that really people struggle with a lot. Oh, man. Because <laughs> you do need to sleep at a slight incline. And this is where people end up coming back and tell me they've been like sleeping in a dining room chair for two days. Like that's not it. Because more is always better. Yeah. You know, it's 30 degrees at the most. That's what I tell people, like two pillows height. And I actually have this amazing pillow system that I recommend to everyone. And no one has purchased it. But the people or the few people who have sleep just fine and love it. And the people that don't, which is 90 percent of people. Um, Are you allowed to, to say the name of the thing or no? I, mean, I could. It's just an, it's on Amazon. It's not oh. like it's a. So, okay. I mean, it's just very, very cool. If anybody's interested, reach out to me. I'll send you the link. It's it is it will change your life after surgery. It's like one hundred fifty dollars and it is the best thing ever. 
So sleep, yes, you do need to sleep at a slight incline and on your back. So if you are a dedicated mm -hmm. like sleep nope. flat on my face sleeper. I'm never sleeper, getting a facelift. Right? You can do it. It's not going to happen. I wouldn't sleep for like three weeks. And there's some people who, who really struggle. And then when they come in, at, you know, ask me when they can sleep on their side. And I say, well, you can now. And then they come back the next day or text me the next day that it was terrible and they're in pain. I'm like, well, I said you could. I didn't say you would. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you probably won't get back to sleeping like normal for six weeks also after surgery. As you'll see on these next few slides when we talk more about where the incisions go and as we already showed you they go around your ear so if you are sleeping on that ear you know it's going to be very sensitive even if you're not in pain during normal activities sleeping on it for eight hours is not going to feel great so right. good things to keep in mind nothing on this list is super scary except apparently everyone is afraid of sleeping on their back <laughs> it, it can be done i promise and i love sleeping on my stomach so it, it can be done all right I, I let's just, get into the reason real quick here. i just don't do full stomach sleeping like a you guess like a I do the lateral decubitus. That's the medical word. Yeah. yeah. See, and I, I, and I like yeah. to hug a pillow. I don't know. There must be some Freudian thing on that. See, yeah, I'm not. Like a, I'm also not like make out with the pillow. It's right next to me. Flat down on my stomach. I'm what more about you, of a Nils? like oh, super. That's very. So if Nils can get a face. That's lift, very Northern like, European. It's also why his skin looks so good. Yeah. No. Weird. I'm yeah. not flat on my stomach. I'm like side stomach. Okay. I'm like mostly stomach, but sort of on the side. Yeah, you're like half C. Yep. Yeah, you you haven't fully yeah. you haven't fully bought in. No, yet. I'm not like face down yet. <laughs> <laughs> like literally. Just well, it's weird because you don't get many people to sleep on their stomach, like full stomach, but then you do get some. Oh yeah. And I had a patient uh, who had a breast augmentation post pregnancy. She was a great candidate for it, and just could not stop sleeping in her stomach and kind of lateralized her lateralized implants. her implants a little bit. You know, and I told her I was like, you can't like. You know, if we have to redo this, you you can't sleep on the side, on or you stomach. can't sleep on your stomach. So, or you can, and you just deal with the fact that your implants are a little wide. Yep, yep. You know. All right, so let's get hit to the reason why everybody is here: the pictures. So, is everyone here because of the pictures? Yes, everybody loves before and afters. Is that what they say? They're not the, here for us. Is that what they say on the internets? Yeah. Not the listeners, but the watchers. The, the watchers, watchers. The watchers. The lurkers. <laughs> so this I'm is. I'm down a, with the listeners, man. <laughs> this is a great example of a mini facelift. This is a patient in her very early 40s. And this is only a couple weeks after surgery, yeah, so you can about a month out. So you can still see a little bit of redness in the area around the ears. Um, Mostly, what I think you can see is a change in her sideburn. Yeah, yeah, and <laughs> that'll grow back. Yeah, and it's kind of the way she brushed her hair too, a little bit on on that also. We had to cut the, and when you do these sideburn incisions, sometimes you cut the hair a little bit, so the hair that usually hangs down is really short. And the after picture, if you're looking on the YouTube channel, Jason Martin MD. But this is a mini facelift, and that only addressed. Basically, the jawline, uh, the the stuff around the mouth, which is the marionette. You can see her before picture has clear marionette lines. This is very premature. She's very young in this photo. She's like low 40s. Uh, you can see the nasal labial folds are obvious in the pre-picture and in the after that's that's gone. The cheeks are better, more defined. The cheeks are up. And overall, it's better. Now, she still has some redness, some swelling, a uh, little sheen to her skin. That's a post surgical swelling and it gets that kind of appearance plus we have them put some sort of um, bacitracin and then lotion on afterwards so kind of a lotiony appearance but yeah this is that's just called dewy dr martin yeah and this is what women die for this is glass skin like, this is beautiful. Oh, is that what we're going for yeah like this okay. is dewy gorgeous skin <laughs> why don't you guys tell me this, this stuff it's just gorgeous right. i think though you can see if you're if you're being really nitpicky about this picture though is she obviously would need a full neck lift at some point you know she's in her early 40s so if she makes it to 50 without getting a full neck lift Maybe, probably not. You know, I think like maybe who was in that five med years. student who was trolling me all the time? Dave. 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 Mm -hmm. Dave's gonna find something in this picture. Yeah. Dave. No, and, Dave. MD. Yeah. But you see, I mean, like, there's still stuff, right? Like, she'll need a neck lift at some point. Like, she's young. She's this is a starter facelift. Yeah. But it's it's mini. hugely transformative. Oh, yeah. And actually, and this picture it's a little misleading because she actually looked not as good as she did in the pre-picture because we did face type before that. If you look at her original picture to the end of the mini facelift her transformation is per, is remarkable there's also a, a video on our youtube channel called face type versus facelift and this is the patient from that video so if you're really kind of interested in this you can see what face type does which is a less invasive procedure we do in the office versus a facelift and there's no comparison the facelift was way better yeah, yeah. 
All right. And this just just a close up of exactly where that incision went. That's the kind of aqua blue line. Yeah. And that you can see that incision goes around. Well, I explained this before around your helix behind the tragus and in front of the earlobe and then goes into the crease behind your ear. And that's where it stops. The and other is actually stopped pretty short back there. Yeah. The other incision goes into the um, hairline. Uh, uh, what's this called? Again? Sideburn. Uh, sideburn. Sorry. <laughs> I, I just like. <laughs> I was going to say temporal hairline. Yep. And I was like, okay, people really don't care about that word. Uh, so the sideburn area, and you can go around the sideburn. I don't like to do that no, as much because really because you can see the scar. Yep. Uh, or you can go into the sideburn. Someone like her who has really thick sideburns. It's better go straight and, through it. Yeah, and yep. you and you definitely shorten the sideburn a little bit, which you could see on her after. Well, but, her hair also hasn't grown back yet. Yeah, it's only four weeks. Right, but but it's it's minimal shortening, and then yep. that scar you'll never see that scar. No, so it's completely hidden. All right. So this is a good example of a full neck. Yeah. She probably needed a little more. She needed everything. But she had pretty severe health issues that limited us to a certain amount of OR time. She's like, I want it all. She came in. She's like, I want everything. Like, Facelift, neck lift, eyelids, rhinoplasty. I mean, she hair transplant. Tummy tuck. Yeah. <laughs> she wanted it yeah. all. And I was like, no. Like, but this is what we can <laughs> Pick do. one. Yeah. Yeah. And we had to limit it because some of her health issues. Again, we worked with her physician. We were real, a real medical office. So yeah. we really did care about her, wanted to make sure she, she got through the surgery just fine. Oh, she did amazing. Yep. And uh, you can see how much better her neck is. But she definitely needs a facelift and some other things, which we were not yeah. able to do. But the this is a great picture that shows no matter how much you pulled on that skin, if you had not fixed the muscle descent on her neck, it would not have looked anywhere near as good. Exactly. You had, I mean, she actually had a pretty long jawline. Yeah, you didn't know But it know looks it. like she had no chin. Yeah. But she actually did. Yeah, they call that a... Like, Ob obtuse cervical mental angle, right? I should just get a T-shirt made up with that on it, right? No one would know what it meant. I mean, like come on, big, man. They'd know that. Like it's bigger than ninety degree. Medicine's angle. like all Latin based, you know. We just say all these big words. <laughs> like obtuse. I remember yeah. that. Like it's the big Pac Man. Obtuse, yeah. <laughs> He's stretching. Isn't it funny how some words you do remember, and some you don't? Like I think most people know obtuse and acute because it's of geometry. The it's the right? baby Pac Man. Yeah, it's a, yeah, it's geometry. So most people would know obtuse. <laughs> Yeah. So great example of a full neck lift and she loved it. Oh my gosh. I think hers was the best because like she like told everyone on earth about it, which was amazing. All of her neighbors, everybody, like she was out gardening, like just to show off her neck. <laughs> was she good. was? Yeah. That's it was cute. good times. This is an example of a direct excision neck lift. Yeah. We also, I think we have this, uh, we have a video about direct excision neck lifts. I think it's called the magic of direct excision neck lifts on it, YouTube. It's on YouTube and on our Instagram yeah. channels. We have this, basically the video edited down to one minute, which you've just if you only have tolerance for one minute videos, you can go on our YouTube or Instagram uh, at jsmartmd. And this is a direct excision neck lift. Really, really nice guy and amazing result. But this is nothing special about this result mm -mm. either. And you, you can see that the waddle underneath the chin, if you're looking at our YouTube channel, is gone. 45 minute procedure, totally awake. Uh, sutures come out in a week. And that guy was like back on his feet with, with oh, within a day. Uh, within a day. Yeah. And I was able to tighten the muscle underneath during the direct excision neck lift. So, you know, it's really amazing to me. I love these surgeries. I, it, for, for, for me in surgery, it feels like a cheat code because it's 45 minutes and it's so direct and I don't have to work around all this stuff. But it's, it is complicated. It takes some mm -hmm. skill or some experience. What was really amazing to me, we put this video out and we did an episode on it. And I didn't think anyone would, you know, I thought it, it's so niche. And the engagement on on both those things was so mm -hmm. high. Yep. And it just shows you there's a big subset of the population that doesn't want a full neck lift or facelift and would consider a direct excision neck lift, at least consider it. Mm -hmm. And definitely we've gotten a lot of consults from those videos, which is very surprising because of people wanting to empower themselves, men across this country. Uh, I've had multiple consults from people in different parts of this country who saw that video and really liked what it was portraying. And they like that for themselves. 45 minute procedure in the office with local yeah. anesthesia. Yeah. And the outcomes is also what they want. <laughs> All right. This just shows from straight on where that incision goes. Mm -hmm. And even though you drew it kind of like a, a like straight lines, it's really not. And we I, talked I gonna, about this on the episode. I was going to do it crooked. but no, yeah, yeah. It's it's more like when you pull that flap together, it's like gears or pieces interlocking like yeah, this. Yes. That's a really good way to put it. Yeah. So even though it comes together as a, as a you drew it as a straight line. It's it's, it's not. not. Yeah. It's a little jagged. Yeah. And it's also, we don't usually go quite that wide on the 
on the horizontal, but we did on him. Yeah, well, because his was so, so bad. bad. That's what yeah. I mean. Like we don't always go that wide, but we had to on him. Yeah. All right, and let's look at this. Was kind of an all-in, right? She was going to do one surgery. We did face, neck. We did eyes. We did not do brow because she didn't need brow. Face, neck, eyes. Really remarkable improvement, but she still looked very much like herself. Yeah, this is the reason I wanted to show. This is actually on our website, mm -hmm. jasonmartinmd.com, and uh, this is uh, this is from a while back. A uh, really nice patient, and I just love this picture because it shows you that she looks like her, mm -hmm. and everything's not improved, everything's not fixed. I think this is like a really realistic mm -hmm. picture. I think if you're thinking about a facelift or a neck lift, like this gives you an idea of what a nice natural face and neck lift looks like. Yeah. So if this appeals to you, then you know I think that maybe you should keep on going down that path to see if you're a candidate. Yeah, and we didn't do like crazy like fat transfer or anything else. Like this was just from surgery. Like she got. This we didn't result. do a micro mini. No, this was a full. Yeah. And you can see that she really needed it. Like you can see the banding, the vertical banding on the neck. You know, there's pretty deep wrinkles around the mouth and they're not gone, but they are drastically improved and very age appropriate. Mm -hmm. You know, like she looks lovely. Like just looks beautiful. Yeah. And is a really awesome person. So that's most of our patients though. Yeah. This shows where her incision went. So this one has the long tail. Yeah, the long tail that goes behind the ear and the crease of the ear and then transfers over to what we call the occipital hairline. What, what is that hairline? That's what I would call it. It's like around the base of the neck. Yeah, the yeah. hair that's behind your ear. Mm -hmm. yeah. I don't know no, how to Nils describe it. Nils just touched it. it, base of the neck. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Oh, that's helpful, Nils. Yep. No, one, no one can yeah. see you. Yeah. No one can see you, Nils. But, uh, <laughs> no, he, he means he understands it. He knows. I mean, yeah. this you're in this yeah. business and you're like pointing to yeah. your face. Yeah. No one could see. It just it traces your hairline, you know, back toward the midline <laughs> of your neck. Okay, yeah. Nils is miming where it goes uh, <laughs> behind the camera. Anyways, um, but yeah, it goes. If you imagine, if you follow the crease behind your ear and then go back uh, to the hairline and then follow that down toward your neck, mm -hmm. that's kind of where it goes. And you know that can be scary a little bit for people, especially for women that pull their hair back into a tight ponytail. And there's ways to put this incision and scar in a, in a, in a, in a, so you could still pull your hair back in a mm -hmm. ponytail. Right after surgery, it's still going to be visible. There's going to be a healing process. But in most of almost all of our patients, they can pull their hair back in a ponytail and not have to worry about it. Yeah. For men, um, you know, that's it is what it is. And so for me, uh, even though I have my surgical cap on, Amy, Amy likes it better when my hair is real short on the sides and the back. And if I had a, a scar that went down, you would conceivably see it, even if it was pretty well healed. Yeah. If my hair was short. If it was as short as it is right now, I mean, yes, you might see it. But again, this is where we really over-exaggerate how much people are looking at us from odd angles. I mean, like, would I see it right now the way you're looking at me? No. Would I see it right now? Well, you're, yes. you're devastating with what you pick up on my face. You're devastating? Like, yeah. You're like, oh, you got a little hair there on your right upper ear. And I was like, that, thanks. That's just, I'm not. I don't look at you like that. That is that. That is like because that's the only thing I can pick on. Yeah. Okay. There's oh, so yeah. much oh, yeah. perfection. I know how this works. I know what you're doing right now. I'm married. I know how this goes. I've done that before. I mean, you're so beautiful. I would never wrong. tell you how good you look in those pants. Like when there's just perfection everywhere, that one hair does really stand out. You know what I'm talking about, Dale. Everything else is perfect. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Not those pants. My love <laughs> blinds me in judging you. Exactly. And I see this one errant hair and I'm like, wow, there is an errant hair in it. Yeah, I'm going to be perfect. I'm, I'm gonna be very honest. I'm very much appreciative that you tell me about my errant hairs mm -hmm. and you help me pick them off. Yeah. Thank see? you. Yeah. And that's what friends do. Exactly. Right. You just don't yes. have errant hairs. You're not. Right. You don't have testosterone floating around like I do. That's true. So, yeah. So see, there you go. So would someone see this incision? No. Only if they're. At the perfect Amy. angle and Amy and you work yeah. with her. And really, I mean, there's other things on our skin. And I think that's what people, you know, it's not like this is incision on a baby, like where the skin is perfect. And there's no other creases or wrinkles anywhere on it. Yeah. There's other stuff going on, you know, so it's not like you focus on just this one thing, like, oh my gosh, like when you look at a person, I mean, like maybe if somebody's like, I, I'm trying to think when you would even see this, like again, your hairdresser and your esthetician, like I said, in the myth busting episode are really the only people that are going to be in a face lift or a neck lift mm -hmm. because they're the only people that are in that area, even if your hair is pulled back. And I have seen women who wear their hair in a bun all the time. Which is, surgery. as we said in the myth busting episode, that's yeah. where we get like many of our referrals. Yep. 
because the hairdressers see our scars like, wow, that looks really good. You should go to that. Dude. Yeah. And they see that they can't see them until yeah. they actually see them. Yeah. It's not like I mean, and we've seen it. We have patients who come we in. We should interview a hairdresser. Right. To tell stylist, us about how the scars me, look. Yeah. yeah. Oh, or an esthetician. I mean, we've seen terrible scars. Yeah, we have. It's terrible. And it's devastating. Yeah. But the, even then, we see these scars and we're like, whoa. And the people are like, oh, yeah. yeah. Like, is that ruining their life or no. do other people notice? No. You know no. who notices? We do. Us. Yeah. No one else. And these are people who've had their face and, and we've, necklace we've for had years. patients who had healed badly in certain areas mm -hmm. and that's a struggle but like even those patients who've had a little bit of scar issues I and mean, it's rare very rare but you still fix it yeah and they mm -hmm. still get on and rarely have an issue yeah it's not like they have social problems no so yeah we're, we're far more critical of ourselves than yeah. anyone else is looking yeah. at us that's the myth buster that's the love yourself episode that's all episodes mm -hmm. all right I think we did it. We got to the end of the book. Who <laughs> was yeah. the monster at the end of the podcast? It was me. Yeah. I don't think I need to do my end soliloquy that I always do. Because, oh, you will. As no. soon as I finish saying my thing, you will. No, I don't think I do. Okay. Well, because no, we, we really kind of packed this one away. We did. Yeah. yeah. We just put away the summer clothes. Now we're heading into winter. That's right. Yeah. Fall and winter is a great time to get a face and neck lift because you can hide out. Scarves. I always say scarves and sunglasses basically hide everything. Yeah. If you wear a scarf and sunglasses after your facelift, even the day after your facelift, no one will know. No one will know. No one. You got to get the big Jackie O round ones, the ones that look like bug eyes. Yeah, yeah. But dark, dark sunglasses. Yeah. Yeah. And a scarf. All right. Well, thank you so much, everyone who made it to the end of this podcast episode. We really appreciate you listening. We hope that we have now busted all the myths. You're not afraid. You have all the details you need. You know what all these different buzzwords mean and what they don't mean. And you're ready to have your facelift. Yeah, let's do it. If you'd like to leave us a comment, we would love it. We love uh, all your comments. Dr. Martin is pointing to our phone number, which is 303-630. I usually do this, but now I'm pointing. 9038. <laughs> Why do you have Willie Mills put some arrows? Yeah. <laughs> and all of our other social media handles are there as well. And they're also in the description box. So we do love voicemails. Love them. I haven't gotten any voicemails in a really long time. And I'm sad about it. Why but it's because that? I stopped begging for them because you made me feel bad about it. But mm. here I am again, begging for voicemails. Like, please leave me a voicemail. We love Somebody it. just leave Amy a voicemail. Yeah. And then you get to hear yourself on the podcast. Yeah. We play those on You're the podcast. You're famous. Yes. You Who doesn't want to be famous? <laughs> <laughs> Most people. So we really I appreciate don't want to be everyone listening. Uh, we'll see you next time. Yeah, listen, your face and neck are worth it. Don't be don't be concerned. Just do it. Just do it. That's what you need on a shirt. Facelifts, just do it. Facelifts, just do it. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Don't forget to check out our sponsor, Let's Get Checked. Let's Get Checked offers fast, affordable, and completely confidential health testing for everything from STDs, male and female hormones, and even COVID-19, right from the comfort of your own home. And remember, new customers and listeners of our podcast get 20% off by using our URL, trylgc.com beauty, and be sure to use the code beauty20 at checkout. That's try, T-R-Y-L-G-C.com slash beauty and use the code beauty20, beauty, B-E-A-T-U-Y, two zero at checkout. Get checked. It's the right thing to do.